Okay, so quick note to say, please be careful with the idea of mild cognitive impairment. So uh, this is like uh, this is like telling someone you have mildly metastatic cancer. It is a late stage of the illness. And so we really want to get people to come in early on. Phase one is you're asymptomatic. So that's really people who are coming in for what they believe is prevention, but often have already started down the pathway. Phase two, the good news, SCI, subjective cognitive impairment, may last 10 years, and virtually everyone responds very well if they do the right things. Phase three is the MCI that I mentioned. Each year, about five to 10% of those people convert to full-on dementia. And phase four is really the dementia phase of Alzheimer's. This is all part of Alzheimer's, but phase four is the dementia part of Alzheimer's. And by definition, you've now begun to lose your activities of daily living. And by the way, I should mention, I just heard from one of the health coaches, uh, Carrie, who's doing a wonderful job in, in uh, New York. And one of the points uh, that she mentioned was, that one of the patients she's dealing with um, has a MOCA score of zero and came in basically uh, with a very low MOCA score. But uh, the husband is noticing very clear improvements and you know she's more interactive and she's doing better with her activities of daily living. And he's really enthusiastic. And in fact, he's showing that uh, how clearly she is improving. So that's great to hear. And yes, people even in late stages can improve if we're doing the right things. But we'd like to encourage, and for the future, what we'd really like to do is have everyone come in for either prevention. If you're 40 or over, come in for prevention. And if you've started to have any cognitive changes, please don't wait. One of the biggest problems is people say, wait. And when we talk about suboptimal outcomes, uh, one of the big problems is that people wait and they wait and wait and wait until now you've really got to rebuild a lot of lost synapses. Um, so Julie, uh, how do you, in, in your APOE4.info, how do you impassion people to, to come in early and to get on active prevention? You know, most people that come to our forum are very motivated because they right. just learned their APOE4 status. Yeah. So that really isn't a problem. I think the bigger problem we're all facing is how to motivate the general population to care about your cognition 10 to 20 years before symptoms are going to show up. And that's exactly when they need to be engaging in the uh, protocol. Yeah, great point. The other thing to mention is this has a feed forward loop, a so-called prionic loop. So we don't want to wait too late because, it, in other words, it's a little bit like a snowball rolling downhill. You don't want to wait till the snowball is really huge. You want to stop it very, very early. Um, and then ongoing exposure. One of the common things, people who are living in moldy homes who still have a very high, uh, you know, a very high ERMI score, for example, and everyone notices that when they remove that exposure, it's much easier. So, you know, if you have people who are not doing well, please try to find out whether there's something that's continuing this. Sometimes it's they're continuing to eat a lot of junk food. Uh, sometimes it's they're not getting into ketosis or they are still insulin resistant. Uh, all these things can contribute. So any sort of ongoing exposure and then severe long-term toxicity. And yeah, we, we see people, um, and I hear this fairly frequently, oh, I've been in this home with mold for 15 years. And now I'm going to try to, you know, re, to uh, reverse everything overnight. Well, it's going to take some time. You have got these mycotoxins now stored in your bones, in your brain, in other organs uh, for years and years and years. And as they're starting to move out, and by the way, that's one of the things that starts to happen with perimenopause and menopause. You start moving these things and mobilizing them back out again. And that we believe that's why so many people present in their late 40s and early 50s, um, often with a non-amnestic uh, problem. Although to be fair, uh, if they are APOE4 positive, there's often some amnestic component as well. And we'll talk about type three in, in the next part here. And then poor compliance, people who are too busy. We hear this all the time. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go overseas for six months and then I'll kind of pick it up again and I'll do it halfway and I'll do a couple things and then I'm gonna go on this trip or do that. You really need to focus. And I think Julie is such a wonderful example uh, of someone who who really focused on this and said, okay, I'm gonna do this and, you know, has had tremendous outcomes. And we hear this all the time when people get really good outcomes that they've really uh, kind of lived the protocol 
uh, for at least the first six months. After a while, it does become easier. So please hang in there. Uh, and again, if it's uh, if you're not getting good outcomes, check to see if you are kind of hitting the major points. And then failure to identify and address the, ra uh, the rate limiting contributors. Uh, and I think Dr. Christine Burke, I'd like to quote her here. She had a very important observation. And again, I think Julie's a wonderful example of that. She said, if you do the basics right, you usually buy yourself about one year. You see some improvement, but for beyond one year, you really need to identify what, what's causing the problem and address those things. So the good news is, even for people who have exposures, if you can do the right things and get yourself in it to be metabolically flexible and you know do the appropriate things and do the, the basic seven things that we're gonna be talking about, you will often do well for the first year. For long-term best outcomes, then you wanna find out, are there mycotoxins as part of this? Um, are there uh, inorganics that you're not aware of, heavy metals, things like that, an unknown or an undiagnosed tick-borne infection? And Julie, I come back to when you were doing great and then started to have a little slipping uh, several years ago, and we, you and I talked and said, okay, there's something, something that's been missed. Let's find out what it is. And the first thing you found is that Babesia was one of the issues. And when you addressed that, things got better. Later then you found out some mycotoxin exposure. Uh, so, you know, the, the bottom line is humans are complicated. Um, we live complicated lives. We get exposed to all sorts of things. We're constantly dealing with trying to keep ourselves in homeostasis and trying to keep ourselves optimized. And so we do have times where things are better and then they may slip down and then they get better and may slip down. And I go back to when I was an intern in medicine many years ago when, yeah, I mean, I would be up for literally two or three nights in a row. So I would be up for, you know, 72 hours. No question. By the time, by the end of that, I could barely even take a history and physical. I would literally fall asleep while I was talking to new patients in the middle of the night. It was horrible. And there's no question my brain was working very poorly. So we all have these times of up and down stress. We have a lot of people um, with, especially the ones with type three, where stress is a huge component. You can literally see when they have very little stress and things are going great, they're doing very well. As soon as they get on an overnight flight or they're stressed out about something, things start to come down again. So def definitely I identifying what are the things that are contributing, so helpful. And you know, again, keep digging until you find them. It might be that you need a cone uh, CT or cone uh, uh, evaluation uh, from uh, uh, you know a cone beam from your uh, dentist. It may be that you have uh, some undiagnosed uh, abscesses. It may be that you have undiagnosed sleep apnea. It may be that you have undiagnosed gut dysbiosis. The good news is when you identify it and address it, things will get better. And then unresolved chronic exposures, um, infections, you know, mold, tick bite illnesses, things like that that we were just talking about. Then the other thing that's important to remember is you may be doing better, but you may still have within your brain microglial activation. And I think that that's, you know, and, and I should also uh, add um, uh, mast cells, another one that can do the same. And, and Julie, maybe, I don't know if you want to mention the, your recent uh, discussion uh, about uh, mast cells, because I think that that could turn out to be helpful for many people. Yeah, so um, my mother has severe mast cell activation, and we actually think it contributed to her hemorrhagic stroke because it causes vascular permeability. Right. Um, my mother is also a migraine sufferer, so her neurologist recently prescribed Nurtec, which is a CGRP inhibitor, and shockingly, it took care of the headache beautifully but it also treated the mast cell activation and her cognition experienced a huge bump up all mm -hmm. with one little tablet. Yeah. So I was shocked and I started scouring the literature to see has anyone else discovered this or found this? And you and I together found there are mechanisms that explain mm -hmm. the mast cell activation improvement and even the cognitive improvement. 
Um, I wish somebody would get interested in this. Um, I wonder if it's an N of one or if it's a, you know, would have a broader ap application, but I think it's fascinating. Yeah, great point. Uh, and it turned out, interestingly, one of the physicians who's involved uh, with the upcoming trial, Dr. Craig Tanio in Hollywood, Florida, um, has also noted this in some of his patients. And he has been uh, trying, he actually has been using a different one called Ubrelvi instead of Nurtec ODT, but they both have similar mechanisms of action. So again, it comes back to the fact that as long as you have activation of the innate immune system, and that can be the microglia, it can be mast cells, um, and, and to some extent, it, it can even be astrocytes, uh, then you're going to have a suboptimal outcome. So we want to look at ways to bring this down. And I would also add one of the researchers that I've worked with for years, Dr. Alexei Karakin, and I give him a lot of credit. His, he's very interested in the interactome, all the things that are interacting, these various proteins and other molecules that are interacting as part of these signaling pathways. And what he's pointed out is if you look at the inflammation that is associated and the immune activation that's associated with Alzheimer's, it really comes closest to a part of the innate immune system, which is the memory part. So you, we all know that your adaptive system has long-term memory. So you have you know, memory lymphocytes, for example. But what hadn't been clear until just about a decade ago or so is that the innate immune system also has a memory and it's stored in three different areas, in your bone marrow, in your endothelial cells, and in your tissue macrophages, which in the brain, that's your microglia. And so these are things that now become hyper responsive. So when you have this memory and the amyloid looks like it is part of the memory, it's saying, I have been insulted, therefore I'm gonna leave some troops out here. And the next time I get that insult, boom, I'm ready to go. So essentially it's saying, if you are APOE4 positive, for example, or if you are inflamed because you've eaten saturated fats or because you've lived in a moldy house, these are all ways to make your innate memory on high alert. And there now, anything that happens to you, this is now engaged. Over time, you're now losing synapses because you've got this active hyper engagement of your innate system memory. And this is why it's so important to get rid of the saturated fats and to get on the you know, extra virgin olive oil, the polyunsaturates, the monounsaturates. We're bringing that engagement down. It's why we use resolvins. We're bringing that engagement down. So this is, and again, it's why we're doing everything from better sleep to meditation and relaxation. All of these things are telling you you shouldn't be on alert. You're going to be okay. You're now going to be doing the right thing. So it's giving us another clue as to why it is that some people don't get better when we otherwise would think that they should be. This ongoing microglial activation, and they're making cytokines, and they're destroying synapses and all these sorts of things.